it remains truly amazing to me that people can read John chapter 1 verses 1 to 18 and come to the conclusion that Jesus is a creation, that Jesus is just a human being who represents God or is one of the many, many manifestations of God is actually God the Father in the flesh. You see nothing like that in this context. And also the idea that the Word is not Jesus, but the Word is just a plan or a concept, an abstract thing that is kind of related to Jesus, but not it's not truly Jesus. How can you read these verses of John inspired by the Holy Spirit and come to such nonsense? In the beginning was the Word. You see, John chapter 1 verses 1 to 18 is called the prologue of John, John's introduction to his gospel. And the whole point of his gospel, John 20 to 31, was to reveal who Jesus really is. He's the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life through his name. He's trying to reveal who Jesus really is. That's the whole point of his gospel. He wrote these things because of that purpose, to have faith and life in his name and therefore be saved. So it's no surprise that verse 1 would be about Jesus, that Jesus would be the Word that was with God and the Word who was God in his very existence and nature. Verse 2 is about Jesus. He's the same who was with God. Verse 3 is about Jesus, creator of absolutely everything. Verse 4 is about Jesus. In him was life. And then you go throughout the context. It's centered around the person of Christ. How can you deny that verse 1 is about Christ? Jesus is called the light that John the Baptist bears witness of. He's called the true light in verse 9. He's contrasted with John the Baptist. And you see in verses like 3.26, to whom thou bearest witness, that's Jesus, John the Baptist bears witness of, ye sent unto John, Jesus said, and ye, he bear witness unto the truth. So it was part of John's ministry to bear witness and testify of Christ, not some impersonal abstract thing. Verse 15, he bear witness of him and cried out saying, I uh, cried saying, this is, this was he of whom I spake, he that cometh after me is preferred before me, for he was before me. The New American Standard Bible says he existed before me. And contextually, this is the best meaning and interpretation. If you look at this context, clearly John the Baptist viewed Jesus as existing prior to him, even though he's the elder cousin of Jesus, because he's the word who was God. He's the word that created absolutely everything. And verse 10, he was in the world. And the world was made by him, and the world knew him not. The light, the true light that enlightens every man cometh into the world. This is parallel to John 10, 36. Jesus says, Say ye of him whom the Father hath sanctified and sent into the world, thou blasphemest, because I said I am the Son of God. Jesus was sent into the world. The same world that he came into, the same world that he was in, was made by him. And yet the world did not recognize him. He came to his own. For the, next, the next verse. He came unto his own, and his own received him not. His own people did not receive Christ. But as many as received him, to them he gave the right, the power to become the sons of God, even them that believed, that believe on his name. The, the object of faith here is Jesus Christ. He came to his own people. His own people rejected him. The world that he created did not recognize him as the creator, as God, as the Christ either. They did not recognize him. He's the true light. Just like Jesus is not literally light, he's not literally the word. Right? The word and the light. When, when Jesus claims to be the good shepherd, the door, and all these things in the same gospel, he's not literally a shepherd. He's not literally a door or a gate. He's not literally light or word, but these things reveal something about who Jesus is in his ministry and his personhood. He's not literally uh, a shepherd. He was actually a carpenter by vocation. Now, a lot of Christians don't realize how deliberate John was with his use of 
Greek grammar and Greek terminology. The Greek term for came into being, or become or made, as the King James translates it, is ginemai. And this Greek term is used a variety of times in these first 18 verses. It means, of course, to have a beginning, to be made. And he uses this Greek term for a lot of things, including the all things in verse 3, of course, including John the Baptist, including the sons of God, including the world. The world came into being, and the flesh, the flesh came into being. So when this video is entitled Easy Proof That Jesus Was Never Created, I'm not talking about Jesus of Nazareth, uh, Nazareth as uh, the Messiah, as uh, according to his humanity, as the servant of God, of course he came into being. Of course his humanity had a beginning and was made. But according to his essential nature, or his original nature, his divine nature, prior to the conception of Mary, prior to the event of John 1.14, the Word was made flesh. The Word simply was. He was there in the beginning and he was God. His essential nature is eternal. John never uses the Greek term ginemai, came into existence, come into being, for the Word, for Jesus, for the Son. Only when the only the flesh, but not the Word in his eternal existence, because the Word simply always was and is. Jesus said before Abraham was born, Ginnemai again, before Abraham came into being, sprang into existence, I am. The Jews wanted to kill him instantly for claiming eternal existence. Ginnemai is even used for grace and truth in verse 17. Grace and truth came by, Ginnemai, were realized or created through Jesus Christ. In contrast to Moses, the law was simply given through Moses. He's just an agent. But grace and truth came into being by Jesus Christ. Only God is the originator of grace and truth. And notice in verse 14, the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. He pitched his tent among us. He is a living, breathing tabernacle of the very glory and presence of God Almighty. God dwelling with us as a human being. He made his residence among us. The word who was God who created everything in verse 3 and verse 10, is identified by John as the only begotten of the Father, or the one and only from the Father, full of grace and truth. So Jesus created grace and truth in verse 17. The Word, who is identified as the only begotten, is full of grace and truth. Clearly the Word is Jesus. How can you deny this? It's, it's, it's just a total mess. How can you not deny the obvious uh, conclusions that John himself is bringing out, is making known. So when John consciously never uses the Greek term ginemai for Jesus or the Word or the Son of God, he is deliberately showing us that the Word eternally was, that the Word eternally existed. You see, in the beginning was the Word points to no origin at all for the word. The Greek grammar is clear. No matter how far you take this in the beginning, how far, however, how far it goes, whether it's 10,000 years ago, 6 billion years ago, uh, a trillion years ago, the word already was. The word was already there in the beginning. He was already there. Uh, the expanded Bible says the word already existed. That's the meaning of the Greek that John uses. Zero origin, zero point of creation. See, if John was an Arian or believed that Jesus was just a human being who represented God, he he should have made that clear. He should have shown an origin of the Word. He should have elaborated on the fact that the Word is not really God. The Word is a creation of God. There's nothing in the context that shows us that the Word is the first creation of God as Arianism or even Jehovah's Witness theology teaches. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. So John doesn't simply say, all things came into being through him. He, he takes it a step further. He goes even, he goes extra far to really emphasize this point, 
to be so emphatic. Apart from him, nothing came into being that has come into being. So if something has come into being, if something has been made, it was made through Jesus. Everything has its existence because of Jesus, because he created everything. Apart from him, nothing came into being. So if something is within the category of made, within the category of created, Jesus existed, exists outside the category of created, because he brought it into existence. If it's within the category of created, Jesus created it. Therefore, he is uncreated. The only way to get around this is if Jesus created himself, which is literally and logically impossible. Did John secretly not really include Jesus in this? Or did, he, did he just think, oh, his readers would know automatically? His readers would expect, oh, they would assume that Jesus, who's called the Word, who was God, is not really God and not really Creator. He's actually the first creation of God, or he's actually the Father in the flesh. Nothing in the context supports the idea that the Father became incarnate or was in the flesh. And to really hammer all these points home, verse 18 is so clear. It's the bookend of verse 1. In other words, it's joined with verse 1. It's like the concluding summary of John and a lot of the concepts that he's brought to light in these verses. It is like the summary and elaboration of verse 1. Who is the Word who was God in the beginning, who always was? Who was the one that the Word was with? You see, the Word was with someone, present with someone. The Greek implies an association, maybe even a fellowship. The Word was with God. They were together. They were present with each other, associating with one another. And God was with someone as well. He was with the Word. He was with the Word, and the Word was with him. They were together in association before creation. But verse 18 makes it even clearer. No man hath seen God at any time. The only begotten Son, which is in the bosom of the Father, he hath declared him. So Jesus, the Son, the only begotten, is in the bosom of the Father, or in his chest, close to his heart, at his side. This is intimate fellowship intimate you know in the in the intimate presence of the father he's the word is identified as the only begotten son who declares or reveals or makes the father known so this is one of the most important reasons why jesus is called the word by john because think of what a word is or the word or even the word of god it is a revelation it's a declaration it's an explanation of who God is. Jesus is the revelation of the Father, the explanation, the declaration of the Father. That's why he can say, he who has seen me has seen the Father, because he is the revelation of everything that God is. He makes the invisible God visible and known by his person and ministry. He is everything that God is. But note the very best and earliest manuscripts of John's Gospel identify Jesus actually as the only begotten God, which can be translated as God, the only Son, God, the one and only, the one and only, the only Son who is himself God, God, the only begotten. And scribes are much more likely to look at a, a very strange and unique uh, title of Jesus like this, only begotten God, and think of John 3.16, very famous verse, and try to correct it, thinking, it, that can't be right, it must be only begotten Son. But only begotten God, for logical and for manuscript reasons, must be the original reading. It is parallel and joined with verse 1. The Word who is God, God the only Son, the only begotten Son, who is with the Father in association in the bosom of the Father, has declared the Father. So the context is very, very clear, consistently. The Word, the Light, the one that John bears witness of, the originator of grace and truth, the only begotten Son who came from the Father, who existed before John the Baptist, he hath declared the Father. It's very clear that this is the one. This is Jesus, the uncreated Son of God, the eternal Son of the Father. And may you study these scriptures and come to faith in what they really mean.